Hello, my name is Sam Breakgear and welcome to The Loudspeaker, your PR and marketing podcast from Publicize, specialist in PR and digital communications. Here, you will learn how to build an effective communication and growth strategy for your business with advice from a variety of experts. Plan ahead and mitigate the damage. People started following me because of that. That's one of the main ways I've gotten us in the big name publications. You need to write it as if it's an email going from you to a friend. You can kind of maximize your ad dollars there. With this show, alongside our free online resources, you will learn how to take the right steps so your business will gain more recognition online, convert more leads to sales, and build greater trust among prospects, clients, and investors. In today's episode, we'll be looking at marketing for a SaaS business based on our guide, The Complete Guide to SaaS Marketing ROI. To explore this topic, we are joined by Dave Hurt, CEO and co-founder of Verb Data, a company that helps SaaS clients build end-user dashboards and reports. From today's discussion, you will learn how SaaS startup founders with no experience can start marketing their company, what should be the main focuses of a marketing strategy at the early stages, and why it's important to start with a minimal viable brand. Dave also shares with our listeners some examples of successful marketing tactics Verb Data has implemented and how early adopters play a role when it comes to marketing. If you want to learn more about SaaS marketing and how it can help grow your startup, then check out the complete guide to SaaS marketing ROI on our website at publicize.co slash guides. There will also be a link in the description of this episode. And if you like this episode, some other episodes from the loudspeaker you should listen to are KPIs to measure digital marketing, how to win media coverage for your SaaS company in a crisis, and setting realistic expectations for the ROI of digital marketing. But now, on with today's episode. So I'm Dave Hurt. I'm a co-founder of uh, Verb Data and CEO. So I spend most of my time focused on product management and sales and marketing, but of course, as a founder, you do a little bit of everything. And um, at Verb, we, we provide a no-code embedded analytics platform for SaaS companies um, to provide their end users with dashboards and reports from within their app. So we're, we're different than most providers because we are highly targeted on SaaS use cases. So most business intelligence tools actually focus on internal reporting, whereas we focus on that external customer-facing reporting. Awesome. Now we are going to be talking about like SaaS marketing today, like from mm-hmm. the perspective of a startup. But one question I did want to ask, like, where did the name Verb Data come from? I'd be really curious to know how that that was decided upon. Yeah. Well, uh, like I said, I'm I'm a product manager by trade, and my business partner is a is um, a developer. So we are by no means um, expert marketers, and so we. Uh, we tossed around a lot of ideas. We didn't want to pay anybody to help uh, come up with the idea. So we really felt like Verb encompassed the, the idea of like doing something with your data, like make it actionable. Um, whereas, you know, most companies who have data, it just kind of sits around. Um, and so we thought, well, we can, you know, make people do something with their data. So uh, we felt like Verb kind of uh, played on that a little bit. You know, that's what I inferred from the name. And that's why I kind of wanted to ask because I, I assumed like maybe it originated from, from that idea. So clearly it, it does resonate and it is clear because I got that before awesome. even asking about that. And that's kind of why I was prompted to, to check. But um, getting on to the, the meat of today's conversation, what advice do you have for founders that are now approaching startup marketing for the first time without any marketing experience? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, my, my background's product. I've said it three times now, sorry. But um, like marketing is definitely not my favorite thing. But the most important thing I've learned at, at this startup at Verb, but also the previous companies and, and companies I've started, is that you can never start too early. Um, and marketing doesn't have to be about selling your product. And um, you know, personally, I, I've had to get over the hurdle of you know, marketing feels kind of icky to me sometimes because it feels very self-promotional. But finding um, little ways where you are comfortable with doing it is, is the best way to kind of step into stuff. So start early, um, start small, and it's not always about selling. Those are the biggest three things that I, I kind of have to remind myself of as I'm working through my marketing plans. Awesome. Now, you mentioned start small. I'd love to know like, what examples do you have from that if you're able to kind of like summarize that in a, a few actions. Yeah, definitely. So. 
um, I mean, obviously the, the first thing you need to start with is like, who, what's your buyer persona? Like, who are you targeting and early stage startup? You definitely want to be really thinking about not your, your, your goal and customer, but who is your early adopter? Who's the most likely person to be, um, you know, buying this product in, in its current form when it's maybe not totally complete, but you can sell them on the vision and uh, they'll get behind that vision. So starting small is, you know, building, build, building that persona. Um, and things that we did, we built that persona as part of like our business plan, part of our early product, um, you know, wireframes. And I went on LinkedIn and I found people who matched that persona and started reaching out to them and just said, Hey, I'm, I'm you know, starting this new idea. Would love your feedback. Um, and those calls weren't just about, um, you know, the product. They were about uh, making decisions about buying this type of product. Um, and so those are the, that's like where we really started with our, with our marketing kind of journey was um, identifying the persona, going, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, which might feel scary to some people, but um, I've always found when doing this, reaching out to random people on LinkedIn, um, people love helping entrepreneurs. They, like, they want to be on that ground level and providing feedback and advice. People like to feel like they're experts. So um, that's one thing that, that we, we started with. Um, the other thing is um, choosing like one channel that you're most comfortable with. Um, so personally, I don't love social media. I don't like to put myself out there and tweet all the time. But if you're comfortable with tweeting, I think um, finding the Twitter community around data or design or whatever that might be, finding the community online that you're comfortable tweeting about and contributing to. Um, it's just the one channel. So what we found was things like podcasts. Like I, I like to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, whether it's networking or, or podcasts like this. Um, and so that's kind of the channel that we chose to start with was something that I felt like I could, um, I'd be excited to do and not like a arduous task that I had to, you know, force myself to do every day or every couple of days. So I'd say focusing on one channel that you really uh, enjoy or you can kind of convince yourself to enjoy. I think that's good advice in the sense that podcast conversations are usually a great way of showcasing yourself uh, and your offering in a very organic kind of way without being too pushy or forceful or even selling really. It's just a natural conversation. And relating to your work with LinkedIn, I think that's kind of smart because now that I think about it, when it comes to LinkedIn, it's, it's far more personal. And actually when people message me on LinkedIn, whether it's to be on this podcast or just to, to reach out and get in touch or they want some podcast advice or knowledge from me or, or my opinion, then I often almost always respond. However, with emails, mm -hmm. I think with emails, it's a lot less personal because we're just inundated with emails. And I, can, I find it easier to just forget about or even ignore an email opposed to a message on LinkedIn. I'd be curious to know, like, what was the response rate for your, your like, outbound kind of contact with um, your early adopters on LinkedIn? Did you get a lot of responses from almost all of them? Or was, did you have to really like, throw a lot of the wall to see for something uh, to stick and get a response? Honestly, it was probably a 50% hit rate. So pretty good for, for any kind of campaign of, of that type. Um, and, you know, the, the ask there was it was very clear. This is not sales. This is a, you know, we're, we're doing some discovery, uh, make them feel good about themselves. Right. So you're an mm. expert. Um, that was also super helpful. Um, and we, I also tried to target people who, like I said, uh, early adopter persona that we expected, but also that had some kind of like some way to connect to them. So previously I've worked in restaurant technology. So if somebody that was a target persona, you know, had experience in the same industry, I'd, I'd kind of relate it to our mutual experience. Um, even better, if we had like a mutual connection on LinkedIn, you could kind of like touch on that. Mm. Um, so these were all pretty customized, but, you know, all around the same ask of, hey, give me 30 minutes. Uh, I have some questions on this and this. Um, you see a lot of um, people telling you to stay away from like the, the phrase, like, I just want to pick your brain, right? Like that's a, <laughs> You know, like uh, in, in being more tactical with it, saying like, I have this question or your experience doing this um, would help me by X, Y, and Z, right? So being a little more specific 
mm. and not just saying, I want to pick your brain because you're smart and you're successful, right? Because those people get a lot of those. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you're more specific, you can relate to them. They're a little bit more likely to, uh, to kind of respond. Mm. Yeah, I found LinkedIn to be incredibly helpful in the sense you can get a better understanding of the person as well. And I like the fact that LinkedIn has their interests and Mm -hmm. um, yeah, their history as well. So you can definitely be more personal in that sense. Build a robust communication strategy for your business using Publicize's digital resources. From toolkits to templates, our resources are available to everyone and anyone, just like this podcast. To scale and grow your business today, visit our guides at publicize.co slash guides and be sure to follow the loudspeaker wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. We mentioned about obviously early adopters and choosing the right channel to uh, engage with them. But that aside, like what should be the main focus of your marketing strategy at the early stages? Yeah. Um, so so when I think about this, like I always think that it's like I said, it's never too early to start marketing. And when you're, when you're pre-product, right, you don't have anything released. Um, you're, what you're doing for marketing is going to be different. You're kind of maybe in a more test phase or more in an awareness phase or, or contribution to the, the general like um, environment. Cause you're, you're building a foundation. Um, and I think that's kind of how I think about early stage marketing is more, building a foundation than um, specifically selling to your target market. Um, And so, so things like, like there's a buyer journey, right? You have to Mm -hmm. think about. So um, somebody doesn't say, I want to buy verb today and they go up and sign. Like they've been thinking about, I need a dashboard for my product, maybe for weeks or months or even years. Right. Um, And that's just been kind of like percolating in their mind. And you need to kind of catch them at some point where, they're ready to move to the next stage from like the percolating stage to like actively like looking stage to like, I'm going to go test it and make a decision. Um, And so if you start too late, you're kind of playing catch up to your customers. And so building that foundation of, um, you know, marketing to people in that percolating stage where they're just kind of like thinking about it, ruminating on dashboards or whatever your product is, um, is a, is like the best place to start. I think so. Um, we've done these podcasts, we've done quite a bit of guest posts and, and blogs um, that are kind of specific to like how we're thinking about our product and, and kind of the hurdles that we've um, had to overcome when we were, you know, uh, building dashboards before Verb. Mm. Um, it's kind of like a, a foundational, like, you know, we've been around the block. We're not just some random company. Uh, and you start doing that, you know, a few months before you're actually ready for your product to be released. Um, and then you're, you're kind of like a little bit like in sync with your customers, right? So you've been doing that, that foundational stuff when they're ready to kind of convert to, you know, actively looking now your product is ready. Um, and what, so, you know, I've gotten the advice to start early. I've always kind of waited too long. I'd say with verb, we probably should have started three or four months of this kind of like, um, blog post podcast kind of stuff. Um, we should have done that a, a bit earlier, but we just, I wanted the product to be perfect. And um, we had to start playing a little catch up with our customers because, of, because we waited a little longer than I think we should have. So I think that's, that's a, a huge thing you should be thinking about is, is starting early. That's interesting. Now, I know before our call, you mentioned the importance of a, a minimal viable brand MVB. And mm-hmm. is there some kind of overlap here? Because obviously you spoke about, not going to market with your idea earlier. I mean, is that an MVB the the best uh, mode of transport, I suppose, to get there and to do that? Or would you be able to first explain like what this is an MVB yeah. and why it's important? Yeah. So I had a, I had a friend that was um, kind of in the like startup marketing agency world. And um, he would always talk about this from like, we always talk about minimally viable product, but we don't think about that iterative process a lot of times when you think about marketing. Um, And so MVB is really just what is your first stab at what your brand looks like? What's your messaging? What do you think is going to resonate with your customers, right? Like you can do interviews, you know, to the cows come home. But if you like, if you don't launch something, you're not going to get the real feedback. You're not going to really know if it resonated or not. So it's like, 
get uh, iteration one of your brand out there um, as fast as possible. And I think when you're, when you're building that MVB early on, um, it's, it's not going to be your brand two years from now. And you have to be like very uh, conscientious about that. So who you're marketing to early on, your early adopters, what resonates with them is not what's going to resonate with people in two years from now when your product is much more mature, you're selling to more mature organizations. Um, so in our context, you know, we're, we're selling mostly to, you know, seed and series A SaaS companies. So, um, you know, they don't have a, they probably have under 200 people, uh, employees. So your set of problems as a CTO or a VP of engineering is very different when you're, you know, you have a, a team of 50 versus a team of 500. Um, and so marketing to those two very similar roles are both VP of engineering, um, but they have a different set of problems. Messaging is going to resonate differently. So knowing that your target today is going to be different than your target in the future helps you focus on what the brand needs to be today and be okay with, you know, evolving that over time. That's cool. I have to say, I've never heard of an MVB before. I've only been familiar with the term minimal viable product, but essentially mm -hmm. it's the, it's more or less the same thing. They're, they're quite parallel to one another. Um, so having that understanding of a minimal viable product has definitely helped me uh, For sure. understand this beforehand. And that makes absolute sense. Now, this is my last question to you. Can you share with our listeners some examples of successful marketing tactics that Verb Data has implemented? Yeah. Um, so, so one of the things that we've done is we've actually brought on um, some extra help. And I think that's been super, you know, that, that's, that's been very helpful for us. So we have a team that helps us put out content. Um, and that content is really focused on doctors. And so um, watching what our customers have done in the platform and where they've struggled, we've learned that they struggle with the actual design of the dashboard and deciding you know, what kind of chart, what kind of information do I want to put on these dashboards? So the team that we've worked with with the content has really focused the content on those problems because we see that people are starting to search for that and we can capture customers at when they're, when they're kind of um, at that trigger moment of I'm, I'm confused as to what I should put on a dashboard, how my dashboard should look. Um, so really using where our early adopters are struggling and, and turning that into marketing content. Um, other things that we've done is we've started working on, um, this is more tactical stuff, but um, digital advertising. So that's something that I've never worked on before. So what I started with was just kind of, you know, assumptions, right? So I worked on where we think we're catching people in the buyer journey. So when they're in that, um, you know, percolating stage versus, um, you know, the, the kind of like decision-making stage. So I started doing some of my own, digital advertising, kind of seeing if there was, you know, any return on investment there. And we were starting to get really good traffic. You know, we got a pretty big boost on not too much money. So we took that to the content team that we were working with and they helped us, you know, really refine that and make it much more optimized, much more professional. But um, what I did there again was kind of like the MVB theory, right? So the iteration theory is like, do it bad to do it better. So, um, I started off with me doing the ads, um, seeing if it worked a little bit. I found some return on investment that was pretty exciting. And so then I took it to people who could really like ramp it up and, um, you know, turn it into like a fully fledged plat uh, program. The other thing is as we're, you know, we're still early stage, so it's hard to show, you know, all the ROI of, of content marketing. But I think part of it is, is trusting the product process that you have to lay the foundation. You're not going to see a immediate result on the blog post you wrote yesterday, right? It's, it's the series of blog posts that you're writing. It's the, it's the cadence at which you're putting information out. Um, and it's also the partnerships that you have. So doing podcasts or guest posts, I've really enjoyed those both writing and talking to people. Um, and we've seen a good lift on those because, you know, we're getting access to different audiences. So um, some of the guest posts that we've done, they get shared on, you know, that partners, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, gets to their audience. And that's like a recurring stream of, of new customers or, or new leads because, um, they continue to share that not just once, but every couple of weeks or every week. Um, and so those partnerships and guest 
posting has been super helpful. So uh, I'd also kind of look into that partnership aspect of things as well. Awesome. Now I have to say, I really enjoyed one phrase that you said earlier, earlier on in that, uh, in that answer is that do it bad to to do it better. And uh, that really resonated with me because I think that we often forget that it's in our failures that we learn the most. And even though that might not be a direct comparison of what you're, you're talking about, but that for me, yeah, really stood out. I enjoyed that. And I, it sounds really, it it, it rolls off the tongue. Uh, Do it bad to do it better. Did you come up with that? No, I, I, um, there, I, I wish I, I could say that I did. Um, I don't remember his name, but he's uh, somebody who spoke at um, uh, a group that I was in for a while. And that was like his tag, he would say. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, it stuck with me. It's been 10 years maybe. And I just feel like when I'm struggling with something that I like is very difficult and I don't think what I'm doing is good. It's like, you just got to get version one done. You can go yeah. get feedback on it. And feedback sometimes is posting it to the internet and sometimes feedback is just having somebody else read it or coming back and just looking at it tomorrow. But Mm. it's like, got to get to somewhere where you say it's, you know, version one is complete. And um, so, yeah, I I think that that encompasses what iteration is right in a nice way. Yeah, I know. I love that. And I think you're absolutely right. You should focus on draft one rather than writing the, the finished product first. And to be honest, Dave, you're the first person I've heard that from. So don't worry. From now on, I'll, I guess I'll associate <laughs> that phrase with you just like you associate that with him. And awesome. um, it's been a great episode. I've really enjoyed having you on here. And if people do want to learn more about Verb Data or keep up with what you're doing, how can they do that? Yeah, check out our website at verbdata.com. And we're also active on social media at Verb Data, both uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. So check us out there. Super. We'll add a link to your website on the description of this podcast. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining me today, Dave. Awesome. Thanks a lot. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and make sure you follow us wherever you get your podcast to stay up to date with the latest PR and digital communications trends. You can also find numerous videos on our YouTube channel where we break down complex topics and the best tips to help you scale and grow your business. If you're ready to take your PR and digital communications to the next level, book a call with one of our growth consultants today. And that's not all. Exclusively for the loudspeaker listeners, receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge. Just go to publicize.co slash LS promo to book your call. Thanks for joining us. And we look forward to having you here again soon.